It's Tuesday, March 25th. I'm Randy McGill. This is IPN Light for Brawls, Brawls, and all those players. And you know who you are, and so do I, because you're not playing me. There is a proposed settlement offer to the families of the 32 people killed at the Virginia Tech massacre last April. Under the terms, each family would receive $100,000 apiece under the proposed settlement made by the state to prevent any lawsuits. That's according to a relative of a shooting victim who has seen the proposal. There would also be 800000 set aside for those injured in the shooting spree. But is that enough? Just weeks before the one-year anniversary of the Virginia Tech massacre, the families of the victims are mulling over a settlement proposal. According to one relative, the Commonwealth of Virginia is offering $100,000 to each of the families of the 32 people who died. Another $800,000 would be set aside for the injured. Under the proposed deal, both groups would have their medical and counseling expenses covered. So far, the families and survivors have received payments ranging from $11,000 to more than $200,000 from a memorial fund. The settlement would keep that fund open for donations for at least five more years. The state is asking for their feedback on those ideas by the end of the month. If the families agree to the plan, they cannot sue the state, government, or the university. Most of the people involved in the negotiations are refusing to comment publicly, but at least one lawyer has said the proposal is not offering enough. He said the school could have done more to limit the tragedy. It took university officials nearly two hours to tell students about the first victims who were killed just after 7 o'clock. The gunman went on to kill 30 others in classrooms across campus before turning the gun on himself. Brian Thomas, The Associated Press. Was it more of the same old, same old from Hillary Clinton, or did she simply misspeak? When she said she had landed under sniper fire during a trip to Bosnia as First Lady in March 1996, her campaign said she misspoke. The Obama campaign said she's been exaggerating her record in an effort to appear seasoned. Last week, Hillary Clinton said this about her 1996 trip to Bosnia. I remember landing under sniper fire. There was supposed to be some kind of a greeting ceremony at the airport, but instead we just ran with our heads down to get into the vehicles. But video from that trip paints a different picture. The First Lady and daughter Chelsea seem to walk calmly along the tarmac in Tuzla, greeting locals and talking to soldiers. At the time, the Bosnian War was over, but NATO peacekeepers were still at risk. I was moved up into the cockpit. Uh, everyone else was told to sit on their uh, bulletproof uh, vests, you recall that. Uh, and we came in in an uh, evasive maneuver. Now, Clinton's admitting she misspoke. And her campaign is trying to downplay a possible controversy over the former First Lady's experience in her husband's administration. There was a saying around the White House that if a place was too small, too poor or too dangerous, the president couldn't go, so send the first lady. Clinton often cites the goodwill visit to Bosnia as part of her foreign policy experience. But Barack Obama's campaign blasted the remarks, saying they were part of a pattern of trying to exaggerate Mrs. Clinton's role in policymaking during her time as first lady. Firing back, Clinton campaign spokesman Howard Wolfson cited her book, Living History, where the New York senator writes that due to reports of snipers in the hills around the airstrip, we were forced to cut short an event on the tarmac with local children. Other reports of the trip, though, have concluded that Clinton faced no extraordinary risks. And Obama supporter Sinbad, a comedian traveling with the first lady and daughter Chelsea back in 96, didn't recall any danger. He says the only red phone moment was, do we eat here or at the next place? We basically were told to run to our cars. Now that is what happened. Clinton uh, has called the misstatement a minor blip. John Belmont, The Associated Press. And in the tragic scene that has become all too familiar, a woman and her four children were found shot to death in their Iowa City home on Monday. Police are checking if a body found after a fiery car crash nearby is the woman's missing husband, Steve Supel, who was recently indicted on federal charges. Neighbors and friends are mourning the deaths of a mother and her four children. You can hardly believe that something like this would happen. You hardly believe it happens when you hear it elsewhere. And then when it happens in your community, it's even worse yet. It's here where police discovered the bodies after getting an early morning 911 call. The caller said police needed to respond immediately and then hung up. When police arrived, the door was locked, the bodies were inside. 
The children were ages 3, 5, 7, and 10. Jean Falk traveled five miles to pay her respects. This was such a heinous, tragic, and senseless act. However, in our community, we have a strong resolve to somehow we get through these difficult times. And I think today, this is one of the most tragic things that could have ever hit us. Police aren't saying how the five died, but local media reports they had been shot. Now police are trying to figure out what happened to the father, Steve Supel. According to court records, he was recently indicted on federal charges of stealing more than a half million dollars from the bank where he worked. Authorities say the family's van was involved in a single vehicle fiery crash about nine miles away. A body was found inside the burning vehicle, but police officers could not immediately identify it. Police say autopsies on the van's driver and the mother and four children are scheduled for Tuesday. Ross Simpson, the Associated Press. Just 10 months after his release from prison, assisted suicide advocate Dr. Jack Kevorkian threw his hat into the political ring yesterday by formally announcing a run for Congress as an independent on Monday. At least the good doc is going from the slammer to the political forum and not the other way around, which seems to be a trend these days. The man once nicknamed Dr. Death says he's running for public office. On Monday, Jack Kevorkian told reporters at a private club outside Detroit that he wants to represent the area in the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm not a politician, by the way. Um, I'm running as an independent. Uh, which means I have no ties to anybody or anything, no fetters. My mind is free. The announcement comes less than a year after he was released from a state prison where he served eight years for allegedly helping a man with Lou Gehrig's disease die. The 79-year-old Kevorkian claims he assisted more than 100 terminally ill people to die during the 1990s. If elected, he says his main goal would be to protect rights that are not laid out in the Constitution. Those rights, he says, include dying through assisted suicide. Kevorkian must collect 3,000 signatures in order to be listed as an independent candidate on the November ballot. Well, the people who support him, God bless them. I can't control them, but for me, I'm not going to support him. Yeah, I think he's a, I think he's an intelligent man, and uh, I think with some of the people we have in Congress right now, uh, I, I don't think that he falls short at all in any way. The Republican and Democrat running for the congressional seat say it's too early to tell what effect Kevorkian may have on the race. Brian Thomas, the Associated Press. Thanks for spending time with me. This is IPN Light. For news all day, go to inplacenews.com. This is a little version of InPlace News. We call IPN Light for blogs, vlogs, and players.